Hi everybody, Stefan Molyneux here with Mike Cernovich. So it has been a grim couple of days in America, a mass shooting in El Paso, Texas, mass shooting in Dayton, Ohio, that seemed to be falling off both extreme sides of the political aisle. And I was doing a lot of research this weekend, but a lot of the information, very salacious, unverified, but you've done some fantastic work teasing out some of the extremities that are going on in American thought, how they may have contributed to or manifested in these kinds of shootings. Now, we've heard, of course, from the mainstream media about the right-wing leanings of the El Paso, Texas shooter, but you've been looking more into the Dayton shooter. And what have you found? Yeah, the Dayton shooter, um, as reported by Heavy and others, they pointed out a Twitter account that was as on the nose of which you would expect a far left-wing person to be. Regular retweets of people in left-wing media, regular retweets of people who have actually smeared you and smeared me. This is a full-on like SPLC kind of guy. And me, I'm so careful about not getting burned that I just said, I, I knew it was him, but I said, I, I'm gonna wait and see what happens. So I waited and other outlets reported that it was the shooter's account and then, of course, we got confirmation today when an NBC so-called reporter claimed that he had read the Twitter account and the Twitter account wasn't actually a far left-wing person. And I thought, OK, well, that's all the confirmation that I needed that we had located the, the shooter's really a, a Twitter account. So what are uh, some of the indications that you found or saw in the Twitter account and other areas that would lead you to categorize him as a left-wing extremist? This was uh, – he would be almost a caricature. Well, not a caricature because you and I deal with it all the time. One of these people, they call them weird Twitter where they have all their – they're very glib about violence. This was an account regularly retweeting left-wing groups, saying that um, – retweeting uh, messaging that they didn't believe ICE agents were human beings, uh, tweeting favorably to AOC, uh, tweeting favorably to the Democrat Socialists of America, was a pro-Antifa account, was actually getting advice on firearms training from what's called the Socialist Gun Owners of America in Ohio. So it would be exactly what you would expect a unilateral, singular, far left-wing account to look like. All the telltale signs, retweeting all the Never Trump propaganda, retweeting the far left-wing propaganda, retweeting the, the violent rhetoric calling everyone you disagree with a Nazi or a white supremacist, using the language of AOC that their concentration camps in America, all right on the nose. And that was, again, whenever something is right on the nose, that is when I always pause and, and make sure that it isn't confirmation bias that had gotten the best of me. And I looked for alternative explanations. I looked for Snopes and Fact Check and all these media people to say that's not really his Twitter account. And very often, as very often the case is, it was the media silence that to me was the biggest indicator the account was real because they weren't debunking. When the Washington Times and Heavy and other outlets were reported that the Twitter account belonged to the Dayton Ohio shooter, there was no rush to debunk by Snopes and others. And I said, OK, usually what the media will do is – They'll just pretend it's not happening. So if they can say this isn't really the account, they'll be right on it, all over it. You got to ban these people. They're spreading disinformation. This isn't the really the shooter's account. Da 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 da. But when it really is the shooter's account, and it shows that the person was a far left wing activist type, then they go radio silent. There did seem to be, and I, I, it seems fairly verified that there were some efforts to change affiliation. There were some efforts to make him look more like a Republican, though he was registered, it seems, as a Democrat. What efforts do you think have been put into attempting to reshape the narrative based upon this? It's got to be one team or the other, and it's got to be an extremist. Yeah. And that's what is troubling me and troubling you. So when the El Paso shooting happened, people, here, there's a number of reactions that are all show that the glibness of our age, they'll go, oh, you know, this El Paso shooter did this and they'll try to time to me. And I go, well, I'm on record not only as opposing political violence, but opposing anybody who writes like that freak does. This guy was a true what you would call bigot. He believes um, what you would believe if you had actually pure hatred in your heart. I'm like, well, you're not owning me. First of all, the desire to own me is a problem. Secondly, you're not owning me because I don't like him. Then they go, why don't you ever disavow white supremacist terrorism? I go, one, I've disavowed all terrorism. I 
held event I held events countering w- what I viewed as a, a reckless movement happening in America. So like I'm I'm really clear on record. I've had a you're, rally you're in the White peace. House press room asking the yeah. people there to and I'll link to this below. But it's in a powerful moment for me uh, as a friend of yours. Just just at, in in rank admiration, you're you're really insisting that even the reporters in the in the White House press room disavow political violence. Yeah, and I don't know why it's that hard. And <laughs> Then when there's a shooting by a far left wing person, immediately they say, well, you know, you you aren't responsible for um, his tweets or just because he retweeted a guy doesn't mean he was a left winger. Every kind of lie you could imagine. And there's two responses to that. One is that I, I read an article in The New York Times about someone who is apparently radicalizing some guy who grew up in a single parent household. And the thesis of the story was that if your fans adopt ideology counter to yours, but that's bad ideology, then you're going to be called like a gateway drug to extremism. I remember the Washington Post tried to blame Ben Shapiro, Paul Joseph Watson, and a bunch of other people for, there was a shooting, I think it was in Montreal, I said Toronto earlier, and I think that was wrong. It was a a big, it was a terrorist attack, of course, against Muslims, which happened. And they, they tried to say, well, anybody whose account he liked on Twitter was somehow responsible for this. And I go, okay, well, then what about the Dayton, Ohio shooter and all the accounts he liked and all the rhetoric he repeated? Is the left responsible for radicalizing violence? And they answer that as they go, well, that, that has nothing to do with it. How, how could you say that? You're so wrong. This is terrible. And then they'll claim that I'm harassing them by reporting on what a mass shooter read from their account. And that is unfortunately where we are is that there's – People who are conservative or right-leaning or whatever people call me these days who just don't want any of the violence to happen, isn't cool with any of it. And then the left-wing media um, continues to endorse tacitly or explicitly violence by Antifa and, and in this case of the far left-wing shooter. Where, where are the think pieces? Hey, did, did, did they radicalize by the left? Calling people Nazis, saying that this is a concentration camp? Is that radicalizing people? No think pieces like that. But I guarantee you, if the El Paso shooter had had an active Twitter account and he was retweeting you and Shapiro and Crowder and you name it, that would be the number one story of the day. Your email and phone would be going off the hook with people demanding that you be banned from social media. It's like, okay, well, we now have a a far left-wing person. This is a far left-wing terrorist. And the media wants to pretend it didn't happen. It is appalling at, at almost every conceivable level that the people like like yourself and, and myself and others who've consistently called for rational decourse, discourse, sorry, for for a cooling of the rhetoric, for a capacity to to find common ground, and there is common ground between reasonable people uh, on all. I don't want to say like lines, but you know, all areas of the political spectrum. There are a lot of decent people who, you know, we want to help the poor. We want health care to be affordable. We want education to be better. We want debt to go down. We want uh, underclasses to have more of an opportunity to drill their way up to the middle class. The methodology of how we go about doing that is a very interesting, complex and deep question that involves ethics and, and politics and economics in particular and so on. So good-hearted people who are coming from particular perspectives, a lot of them have the same goal. And the question is, how do we best achieve it, right? And and I can guarantee you the way we do not achieve it is by shooting people, by calling for, you know, there was a guy uh, calling for uh, uh, the eradication of, of people who are on the right. This is the, half the American population, according to some, some data. That is going to lead very – calling uh, detention centers concentration camps and calling everyone Nazis, this is, uh, as you know, it's a dog whistle for crazy people to target uh, people that the leftists disagree with. It does happen on the right as well, but I don't find it to be nearly as, as vivid, and certainly it's not as mainstream, and it's not like all over CNN or, or the New York Times or other places where these extremities there's, – there's not a, a Congress – man or congresswoman tweeting out like AOC does about, you know, concentration camps and so on. And and so I do think that where we need to focus our attention is on the left. And if they continue with this escalation and they continue with this rhetoric, it's going to be increasingly hard to call for moderation on one side if the other side continues to escalate. I'd want to do it and I'm going to continue to do it no matter what, but it just gets tougher to be to be heard in that clamor. Yeah, they, it's tougher to be heard. It is, um, again, the radicalized language being used 
the the cheap language has a number of effects and we've talked about this for years and that's why when these shootings happen they're very um they're simultaneously tragic and they're also unfortunately predictable now some loser is going to cl- try to claim that i don't care because this is predictable but a, a bad event can be predictable and when you refer to like there was a terrorist attack in ice funny how that got buried right because that shooter was stopped by ice agents he was trying to blow up a propane tank and that shooter said he was inspired by the language of the left concentration camps these dehumanizing language and we just can't seem to get the left to to tone it down and the problem and i don't know if this is because they're maybe young they don't have kids or whatever most left-wing activist reporters I don't think they get – nobody wins in a, in a civil war. Nobody wins when you can't go to the Gilroy Garlic Festival and hold hands with your daughter and, and wife and just walk around. Nobody wins when you can't go to a Walmart shopping. Nobody wins when you can't go out to a club at night and have a couple of drinks with your friends because there might be an act of terror. And the, the rhetoric on the left, again, it, it needs to stop. And when people go, what about the rhetoric on the right? I go – D- you, you mean dehumanizing language? Yeah, I don't think we should call um, people things. I don't, I don't refer to people as human beings um, in, in the kind of language that the left uses when they're talking about ICE or people on the right. But here, here we are, man. And unfortunately, it's only going to get worse. What did you find in terms of the scramble by some reporters or commentators or quasi-reporters regarding ties to the shooter? Yeah, he was – the shooter was a fanboy, regularly retweeting them, amplifying them, quote retweeting. The most disturbing thing that I found actually was – and this is one of those weird moments that it takes a while to process – is the shooter was reading disinformation about me spread by a left-wing activist a couple hours before he went on a shooting spree. So that was a, a dog whistle, I believe, to to target me, and uh, a person claimed – that I and another person had um, advanced knowledge of the El Paso shooting, which is absurd. We didn't, um, we didn't, and we didn't say or intimate that we had it at all. But by trying to falsely tie me to the El Paso shooting, that was like a dog whistle. And then there was a tweet insulting me, falsely claiming that I was involved in something else that I wasn't actually involved in. And that was one of the last remaining likes before the Dayton, Ohio shooter went on to commit his terrorist attack. And I, uh, I really uh, sympathize with that. He certainly was no fan of mine, but it was not quite, I think, as explicit as some of the hostility that was being directed towards you. And, you know, as we know, and, and as we have been talking about for years, Mike, if we are called Nazis, if we are called white supremacists, if we call this, that and the other, that is a very clear signal for unstable people to go and and believe that they are acting for the greater good of humanity by taking out horrible people who just want the world to burn and so on. And it's incredibly dangerous stuff. And, of course, if it was going the other way, people would be completely mental. And uh, Yeah, and I want to and, – and, and I'm looking for something right now which is even worse. Um, there was a, a tweet liked by the shooter which directly targeted Jack Posobiec and really no uncertain terms. Um, there was a, a person said, raise your hand if you agree it's time to crush – these vile little worms into dust once and for all. And that was a person, quote, uh, retweeting Jack Posobiec. And then the mass shooter um, had liked that. And again, these were being liked just before the attack. So here's what I think happened, Stefan. I, I don't think that this was what you would call – this is a, a distinction that you and I and other people who are serious would make but the media would never make, which is the attack was carried out by a far left-wing – either activist or activist type, but I don't think it was far left-wing terrorism in the sense that they didn't target a gathering of conservatives. I think it was uh, an angry, alienated, bitter left-wing person who was consuming uh, bitter, angry, fake stuff about me, Posobiec, you, so many other people, and then he just went into a rage spiral, and then he went out and committed a mass shooting. And that's why, again, I want to be clear. It's one of those... Maybe it's a distinction that doesn't mean a difference. I don't know. People could argue it both ways. But I would say that the attack was carried out by the far left. But I wouldn't say that it was far left-wing terrorism per se because the goal was – on the shooter's mind, he just melted down from all this toxic brew that he had stayed in with the far left-wing media accounts. 
Well, I think that's important because, as you say, he didn't have a political target in the way that the guy attacking the, the, the ICE facility clearly did and was clearly motivated by particular language. There, there is a kind of hellscape that occurs in the mind where people just become nihilistic. They have nothing to live for. And I really do believe that if you pump people full of, you know, the Nazis are taking over and, uh, uh, and the world is going to end in, in a decade. And I like you, when you take away people's capacity to build step by step into a sort of better, stable, happy life, uh, I think it does radicalize people because you have to have something to live for in order to suppress your darker instincts. It's the old thing like the, the guy who's on death row, who's got his last meal, well, he doesn't really care about the carb levels. He doesn't really care about the sugar content because it's his last meal. And if you keep telling people that the world is about to explode and, and the climate is about to turn everything into a fiery desert and there's nothing, it really does get tough, particularly for less robust people, to sense that they have a future. And I think that doesn't make people evil, but it gives them less ammunition with, with which to hold back the darker sides of their natures. Well, he's probably um, uh, probably using drugs. He's in a dark room at night with nothing else lighting him but a laptop, and he's reading things that are toxic and making him angry, and he's creating a cycle. He's just rage, and then he killed his sister, for example, yeah. and he just went on some kind of uncontrollable rage spiral because the words that we read do impact our minds and do impact our thinking, and everything he was reading was about rage telling people that there's war for happening. I remember, I mean, for example, I remember how much trouble Alex Jones got in. This was used actually to ban him but because he had said that get your battle rifles ready. And he even said, I'm being metaphorical. But there were a bunch of articles saying, well, he's radicalizing people for violence. Well, what about these left-wing accounts, right? People go, well, that's what about is. I mean, the answer, this is the Socratic method. The Socratic method is that you're trying to discover the rule that governs human behavior by looking at discrete examples. So if you're in the media and you're saying, well, if some you know kid believes bad things because he watched Molyneux, even though the stuff the kid believes are different than what Molyneux even talks about, okay, now you said then that there is something to look at. Okay, well, if this Dayton, Ohio mass shooter, terrorist, what people want to call him, if he's reading all this left-wing anger bait stuff, then why is that different? Why would you not say we need to have a conversation about left-wing rhetoric? And then they go, what about ism? Or they'll go, what about comment? And you know, what about all this other stuff? I'm like, well, first of all, I never had anything to do with that. Second of all, if, if one of my readers, a big fan of me, did something heinous, then you know what I would say? I would say I feel terrible. I'm not responsible for what he did, but I'm willing to have a conversation. I'm willing to, to look into you know, my own language, my own rhetoric, I'm, I'm willing to have a conversation, I'm willing to do some soul searching. But the left, this is not speculative. Again, this is not hypothetical. This is not a Twitter account followed 50 people and he followed everybody. This was a, a Twitter account that followed left wing accounts. He wanted agitation, he wanted far left wing propaganda. And it ruined his mind. And we've had prior shooters who followed people like the Young Turks. There was an attack uh, that you have written about that was motivated by the SPLC, according to some reports. Well, the the floor leak, there was no actually, that's not speculative. That's a matter of public record. Uh, there was a attempted mass shooting in Washington, D.C. at the Family Research Council. And when the FBI interrogated him, they said, what are you? He said, I'm a left-wing activist. And they said, well, how'd you find this place? And he said, I went on the SPLC website. And he had, uh, I think, two or three other names written down. And they were also groups listed as on the hate watch of the SPLC. So there, there's what you would call a direct nexus. And then the nexus becomes a little bit less direct. And here's what I mean by that. We know that Elliot Roger was a, a big fan of the Young Turks. That got scrubbed from the internet. But we, we all have the screenshots and we know that he was a subscriber. OK, well, yeah, the Young Turks are kind of toxic. But is it really fair to blame Elliot Roger on them? There's an argument to be had there. But if they say that you're responsible for what other people um, do, then you would have to say, well, why is one different than the other? And then you have there was a Seattle mall shooting. I forget the or a stabbing. I think I forget the person's. There's so many of these. Unfortunately, it's becoming you have to actually have an encyclopedia. Unfortunately, this person was also a big fan of the Young Turks. 
And those are, again, well, are fans, you know, what do you mean? But in the case of the Family Research Council shooting, there was a direct nexus. There's court records. The Floyd Lee Corkins, the shooter, said, I went in there to kill as many people as I possibly could. And I went there because I found them on the SPLC website. Okay, that's that's as clean and direct a nexus as you can get from terrorism and incitement there too. Now, with the Twitter account of the uh, Dayton, Ohio terrorist, well, he was reading all this material regularly. He was reading it just before the shooting. He was embroiled in all of this negative, toxic mindset, toxic content. So that's a really close direct nexus. And uh, and again, if the El Paso shooter had a Twitter account and all he was doing is retweeting conservatives all day, I guarantee you we'd be having a conversation about that. And it would be the number one conversation on the news. Instead, they're saying El Paso, uh, Trump, Fox News, just throwing out buzzwords. And then you're like, well, what about Dayton? They go, well, what about Dayton? Why are you trying to use whataboutism to distract from El Paso? <laughs> no, no, we're not trying to distract from El Paso. We're trying to say that people are losing their minds. And you can call them both sides, which is weird because I'm not on the side of uh, people who believe like the El Paso guy. He's not on my side. But if you want to claim that there's a side and one side is far right and one side is far left, then you have to realize well, we just had a weekend shooting. You, you, there's never going to be a better social scientific study that you could ever conduct. Left wing shooter, very active Twitter account, very easy to ascertain his ideology. He said he'd vote for Elizabeth Warren. He said he wouldn't vote for Kamala because she's a cop. He followed all the Antifa bloggers, retweeted them, engaged with them, agreed with them, endorsed violence against all of us. Okay, El Paso shooter had a manifesto. There you go, apples to apples. It's right here, r right at the same time. But Dayton, Ohio, that shooting went away real fast once that Twitter account was prominently displayed and prominently shared. Yeah, that's very true. And the fact that he disliked the people who call for rational discourse, I think, is really important. And if, if I were to sort of characterize this divide, Mike, let me know what you think about this. The people on the right dislike particular ideas. And they dislike collectivism, they dislike postmodernism, they dislike relativism, and um, they dislike uh, uh, socialism, communism, and so on. And they go hard against those ideas, which I think is what you should do if you consider ideas to be dangerous or, or, or bad and so on. And they go hard against those ideas. And occasionally, you know, there's some intellectual shadow or penumbra against particular individuals, but they're really focusing on the ideas. The difference seems to be... I think, that on the left, they, they're not sure exactly what they're against, but they sure are angry at particular people. And that, to me, is a very... So attack the ideas, not the person, I think, is, is the way to have a civilized discourse. And I don't think you should restrain or pussyfoot around ideas that are particularly dangerous. And you know, communism killed like over 100 million people in, in, in a century. But don't go for individuals because individuals are complex. Ideas can be attacked and there's going to be maybe some shadow cast on particular individuals, but go for the ideas. Once you start advocating violence against particular individuals, and this is what, of course, I hated about the El Paso uh, guy who obviously was was racist and 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 uh, terrified of, of what he called the invasion and so on. Okay, so so really focus hard and, and, and work for immigration reform and try and support it and, and talk about the things that are difficult, but you don't go and start shooting up people. That is that is no longer attacking ideas. That is that is killing actual individual human beings. And that seems to me one of the divides that to attack an idea is to me very civilized. To attack human beings is really the height of barbarism. Well, th that's the end result of, and this is why the left doesn't want to have the conversation, is it the El Paso shooting is the end result of identity politics. The Dayton, Ohio shooting, again, the shooter had those ty kinds of ideas where you just view other human beings as monoliths. Okay, that person is a straight white male, therefore he's evil. That person it, has another characteristic, therefore that person is an, another person. Then they view each other as like little armies and then they attack each other. Whereas the more conservative approach is grounded primarily in Christianity, which is the idea of like, redemption. Hey, hey, you just believe the wrong things, right? So hate the sin, not the sinner. And like in modern in modern Christianity, there are people who 
they'll they'll say, for example, they don't believe that gay marriage is Christian, but they would say you shouldn't hate gay people. You should pray for gay people. And I personally believe gay being gay is a choice and there are tough theological issues with all this. And I'm not going to get into, but the fundamental belief is that people are redeemable. And the last fundamental belief is that other people who share certain characteristics by virtue of having those characteristics, such as being white or straight, are evil. And then other groups now have adopted the identity politics of the left, and they're now targeting other people who have different characteristics uh, to them. And this was, again, all, all foreseeable, predictable. For example, when the punch a Nazi meme came and they thought, oh, LOL, isn't that so funny? Violence, and I, w- I would say, well, what if, you know, what happens when people view you as a Nazi? Well, I'm not the Nazis. Don't, you know, the, the other people are the Nazis. I go, but that is never how it works. That's not the way. Any, if you know anything about human nature, human psychology, if you've watched a History Channel special, you know you never just get to say, well, violence against Nazis is, is okay, but they're Nazis, and that'll never be used on us, and they won't see us as Nazis. And, of course, we're, we're now seeing the normalization of political violence, the intersecting with identity politics and that's what makes the times today dangerous and there was i think an interesting distinction between these two shooters as well so i won't get into details i'll put a couple links below but the el paso texas shooter came from i think what could be reasonably described as an extremely toxic and dysfunctional background like his father was a a, a therapist who seemed to have some significant issues he was a self-proclaimed drug addict for 40 years and you know he was also treating people while being a drug addict himself doing lord knows how much damage to vulnerable people and so on right and this is all in in his autobiography that he published so this is not any kind of hearsay this is straight from the horse's mouth so there's some significant indications of an extremely dysfunctional family. I did look into the Dayton, Ohio's family, uh, the Dayton, Ohio shooter's family. You know, I mean, nothing un- nothing that would stand out as as untoward. And, you know, history is uh, people talking about like he was you know, nasty in high school and so on, right? But the family itself doesn't have any particularly obvious markers. Now, it's early and, and this may change over time. And it's really, of course, hard to, to stare through the fourth wall of a family home and know what goes on inside. But if I compare these two uh, evil people, uh, w- one, you can sort of say, okay, you know, what he did was absolutely immoral, evil and wretched. But I can see some particular environment that might end up with him being really messed up. And it's harder to see, or at least I, I don't see anything obvious with the Dayton, Ohio shooter. And that seems to me, okay, well, if, if one guy's radicalized by an incredibly monstrous family life, where's the other guy going crazy from? Now, it could be any number of things that we don't know about yet. But just from where I sit, one's pretty clear and the other one does not seem to be clear at all. Well, people, I think, are being raised by the Internet. And that that's fundamentally the problem. I I read a tweet, a couple of tweets today that said most children won't grow up in a home where there's books everywhere. And I thought, yeah, that's profound in a way where there were bookstores, um, right? You would walk down the street. There was a little local bookstore, used bookstore. And parenting has been outsourced to the Internet. And that allows people to get in their little subcultures and engage in tribalism in a different way. So one of the paradoxes of my thinking and lifestyle and choices are that the internet makes it if you're kind of a niche niche person and people just aren't interested in what you're interested in, then you can unite with like-minded people on the internet, whereas conventional living and conventional people can be maybe not always interested in the same things you are. Now, the flip side, though, is that people are all finding their little tribes in their community and not being forced to interact with each other. Now, in the case of the Dayton, Ohio shooter, he had threatened to kill people. I believe he was expelled from school. I haven't seen that confirmed yet. As far as I've seen reported, he had both a kill list for the boys and a rape list for the girls. This is according to his uh, school uh, mates and was, you know, pretty universally loathed and feared. And I'm not sure how you end up just tootling around society with those kind of predilections. Yeah. And where are the parents? So there's a number of things was he on, you know, antidepressants and w- mental health issues? I don't know. They all have a look. There, there's something to it where there's a vacant stare in the eyes of these people. Is that environmental? I, I don't know. I don't, and I'm, I'm happy to say I don't know. Scott Adams had a good tweet, which was anybody with a univariable 
explanation for these shootings is just a hack and you can dismiss them. So if your if your explanation is, well, he was Republican or well, he's Democrat or, you know, single mom or was on antidepressants or that or that. It's like, well, if you're only in one variable thinking, then you're not actually thinking. This is very complex. And it's okay, I think. I wish more people would take this approach. You just say, I don't know. I don't know. We need to think about a lot of these things. But we, we do know there's a pattern. It, 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 it tends to be, first of all, almost all violence is male. This is non-controversial. The shootings happening in Baltimore – Chicago and others tend to be by people of a different race. And then these big sort of wholesale shootings tend to be white males. And the, uh, the, the whole Republican, well, what about Chicago, 53 shootings? It's like, okay, can we, can we talk about these issues too, though? Right? There's this game, and, and that's the problem. The media feeds into it. They, they rush so hard to blame conservatives or Republicans that then conservatives and Republicans are being falsely blamed. And then they want to deflect and then say, well, but, you know, but Democrats run Chicago and Baltimore and look at that. And then people like us are thinking, well, it's all well and good that you want to scream at each other and blame each other. But wouldn't it be more productive and healthy for us to find out or at least try to find out what's going on? Well, and we won't, as, as you say, as long as people try to reduce complex uh, situations for, you know, for one particular variable, which usually is serving their political motives and and that's you know it, it is tempting of course to try when you have a particularly strong passion or mission to say i'm going to try and find some way to to use this tragedy to further my mission right and you know if your mission is good it's understandable although it does reduce things down to one variable or two variables where it is very complex it is very complex and then people say oh well you know this means we got to have gun control it's like no i don't think that's going to be uh, the answer there were more guns per capita in america in 1900 and these kinds mm -hmm. of shootings weren't uh, weren't going on. As you say, there are different ethnic breakdowns. I've heard uh, different uh, ways of looking at it, depending on how you define it. One race more than another. It's very complex. Yeah, there's a lot of single mom shooters, but you think of all the millions of people like myself raised by single moms who didn't become shooters. Again, it's not really going to, you're not going to get a lot of causality there. I think it's going to be a whole bunch of overlapping circles. And then we try and find where these particular motives are. and I did a presentation recently on the destruction of America's mental health care system where uh, people who had real issues were taken out of society not put in prison but put into areas where they had talk therapy they they were in peaceful serene beautiful environments they had meaningful labor and then of course when the um, the magic of the SSRIs came along and everyone was like hey we got a cure they just dumped them out on the streets and gave them fistfuls of medication which worked about as well as you imagine it would which was terribly and these are all very complex issues that we need to resolve and we're not going to be able to resolve them if people just go to their collective corners and start screaming at everyone else and it doesn't and that's the problem it doesn't do us any good if we have to live in a society that's sort of a banal statement you would think but we all we have to live in a society and with people yelling at each other radicalizing more people we're going to be less safe than we were this past weekend, because people aren't learning anything, people aren't coming together, people aren't having conversations, it's more finger pointing. And we now know, again, this is not, uh, this was not unknown to us before, but we now know that the left wing media just will not take any accountability or responsibility for what their little fans do. And they're deflecting or one, one NBC guy, again, he, he said that the, the shooter was, well, he was kind of politically down the, down the aisle on both sides. No, he wasn't. No. All day Straight yesterday. Straight up socialist, we were, yeah. Yeah, th there's, no, there's no maybe a little bit. No, he was a far left-wing socialist. DSA, he was probably a DSA member. Um, the media, I mean, if it were any other way, the media would be banging down the doors of the socialist organizations asking for comment and whatnot. We're not seeing that happen. And what's also happening is, there was an article by uh, Quillette, Claire Lehman or something like that, where they show the connection between left-wing reporters and Antifa. And the response to that was that, well, we're connected. The response to that was, well, you're trying to get us, you know, incitement. And now you're like, wait a minute, all these reporters who are connected to Antifa, they were all well-liked by the shooter. But – now they're going to try to say that I'm harassing them by reporting on them and literally just saying, no, I mean, here's who the shooter liked. Here's who he retweeted. Here's the conversations. And this is this is what they always do. 
And all the media does is they radicalize everyone else more. They make everything else more of a disaster. And it's quite frankly disgusting. So let's close with this, Mike. You and I, I mean, I've, I've done enough of these speeches. So I, I really want people to hear from you. Uh, you and I have been working for let's get facts, reason and evidence. Let's stop getting so hysterical. Let's stop getting so enraged at particular individuals. Get mad at ideas all you want, but don't target individuals. We've been working on this project, I mean, for, for, for many years. What is it that you would really like people to take away from these tragedies? You know, it's a, you, you can't make a tragedy a good thing. The best you can do is try and get good out of the tragedy. It doesn't bring anyone back to life, but it means that their deaths can hopefully uh, uh, bring us together in some sort of rational discourse. So what is it you'd really, really like for people to, to take away from these kinds of horrors? Well, one is that you have to be vigilant now. Um, you should have an everyday carry kit with a tourniquet. And when I go, for example, to a movie theater, I carry a high lumens flashlight because if you're in an environment where you can't carry a firearm or where shooting a firearm would be reckless, that there's an attack in a theater, you can actually blind people with the high lumens light. So the, the number one lesson is everybody should um, know how to use a tourniquet, be more vigilant. And this is unfortunate. One of the great privileges of living in a Western society is that if you and I met at a cafe and had some espresso, there wasn't going to be a shooting. There wasn't going to be a car exploding. And we're now learning that Western civilization could be a blip, something that happened for a minute or two in the grand course of human history, or it could be something that we're going to preserve. The, the, another, the, the bigger message beyond that even is it, don't let them radicalize you. That's what the media is trying to do. They're not going to radicalize me. They attack me. They smear me. They attack you. They smear you because they're hoping they can radicalize us so that then they can create a bigger problem for them to solve and they create a bigger problem for them to solve. So I know that when these groups like the SPLC target me, I know what they're trying to do. I know about Floyd Lee Corkins. I know uh, what they're trying to do, but they're not going to radicalize me and anybody listening here. Don't let anyone radicalize you. And by the way, that means people in your friendly little chat rooms. There was a person in, um, I believe it was Ohio. Actually, he painted a swastika on a over, over by a synagogue at a building and, you, you know, I read all the police reports and there was agitprop there. There was somebody saying, oh, you're, you know, what? go do that. Go do that. It's funny. LOL. You better be careful who you're hanging out with. So don't let the left radicalize you. And don't think people in the chat rooms who are trying to get you to do things or, or telling you man up, take act, right? There's always these like codes. Oh, what, you know, why don't you just keep talking to quit talking, do something about it. Be a man or something. Don't let anybody radicalize you. There's a battle for our minds. And it's happening by extremists on both sides. And frankly, uh, I don't believe Russia is competent enough to pull it off. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's like Chinese intel or something finding these isolated, lone white men and then radicalizing them into taking acts of violence. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, there is this constant undertow when you're out there in the public sphere calling for conversation and dialogue. There's this constant undertow. And I see it in, in, in my feeds as well. People are like, oh, the age for arguments is past. The time for, for conversation is past. It's like, no, 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 no. We have the greatest communication tool in the history of, of the planet. And it's going to be used by evil people. Uh, but it's also available to, to good people like you and I. And we, we simply cannot surrender the necessary dialogue to hysterical action, which will brutalize. And man, I don't know if it's like people just like, well, you know, we haven't had a war in a, in a while. I'm sure it's just like it is in the movies. It's like, it's really not. You know, this is not a superhero situation. This is going to be people who who don't have water and, and have crying babies. This is going to be people, they turn on the, the light and nothing happens because uh, someone sabotaged the electrical grid or, or, or someone took a shell uh, in, in some power generator or something. Uh, this is when people uh, uh, look at the fridge and say, okay, how am I going to live for the next two weeks or more because the grocery store has been cleaned out or set fire to? I mean, this is like, it's a thin line, man. It's a thin line between civilization and chaos. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to fight to the very, you know, bitter end. And I'm, you know, I'm sure we can turn these things around, uh, but... It really gets nasty, unpleasant, brutal, vicious, and life gets very, very short and cheap when we lose this civilization. And all the people who are trying to goad people into action, you know, man, I hope that you never get what you want. And, and you better hope it too, because what you're going to get if you get your way is going to be something that you will regret for probably only a very short time. 
All right. Well, thanks very much for your time, Mike. Uh, people can go to Cernovich.com for uh, more of your work and, and your articles, Don. We'll put a link to Guerrilla Mindset. Mike's a great book. And uh, really, really appreciate your time today. I hope your family as well. Yeah, I hope yours as well, too. And, and to echo your message, just know that they're bad actors trying to radicalize minds. Don't let them do it. All right. We'll keep, th- we'll keep that in mind. Thanks, Mike. Take care.